Good evening, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand. I am Panu Wong Chiu-um, the president of the FCCT and senior correspondent for Reuters. I want to extend a special warm welcome to Tan Puying Sirikitia Jensen or Kun Mai to our club this evening, where she will be talking about her 100 years between project in which she retraced King Jualungkorn's trip to Norway in 1907. As a personal lover for Thai history, I'm excited by tonight's event. King Jualungkorn or Rama V, various travels to Europe has a special place in Thai history. They're often seen in the light of the Thai monarch's larger modernization projects for the country and also as part of his diplomatic maneuvering at a time when Siam was facing threats from European imperialism. There are many unique heritage sites that mark King Jualungkorn's visits in various places around Europe. And beyond the official diplomatic and official documents, Rama V's trips are also popularly known among Thai specialists and interested public members through his private letters to his daughter. Thai primary source not only shed light on Siamese foreign affairs at the time, but also glimpses into the personal, the personality, the views, the tastes of the absolute Thai monarch as he made his journey through foreign cultures. The talk tonight by King Jualongkorn's great-great-granddaughter is therefore very fascinating. Kun Mai's approach to this piece of fascinating history is through a blend of traditional archive research and her own adventure in Europe, as well as a blend between photography, art exhibition, and design. There is also a fusion between the history and the personal. We are thrilled to welcome her here, and I hope in turn that she enjoyed her experience uh, in visiting us, the oldest and the largest foreign press club in Southeast Asia, and we hope that she will come back in the future. So with that, I'll leave it to you, Gwen. Thanks very much, Panu. And uh, again, um, good evening, everyone, and viewers on Facebook. Just a, a few things about tonight. We are um, live streaming it, which is unusual given the recent decision that we won't be live streaming a lot of our events. We felt tonight was uh, really special, and also a lot of people, I think, overseas might want to watch. And the point about live streaming, I suppose, is questions if you would like to um, follow up on anything that uh, Kunmai is uh, bringing up in her talk. Um, we will take some questions on um, over the Facebook and from the floor. Also for people in the clubhouse, uh, we are uh, serving food, thank you, <laughs> just to make sure you don't get confused. We are serving um, uh, meals after the talk, but uh, I can see some people have drinks if you uh, want to uh, uh, get another drink, that'll be possible through the event. And the bathrooms are out near the elevator if you need to do that. So um, just to, uh, to get right into it here. Um, now, you've heard about Tampuying Sirikithia Jensen, um, but I just wanted to tell you just a little more about our esteemed speaker. She's, as you, you know, a granddaughter of the late King Bhumipon um, and a niece of the reigning King Vajira Longkorn. Um, and she is the daughter, a daughter of Princess Ubon Ratana Rajakanya, uh, the king's eldest daughter, and her American former husband, uh, Peter Lad Jensen. Uh, Tan Puying Mai was educated in the US, attending the University of California, Riverside, and graduating from New York University, class of 2007, majoring in East Asian studies with a focus on the histories of Japan and China. But where I got really excited was learning that she launched her career in the fashion world initially, not least as um, working for the office of Japanese designer Yoji Yamamoto, and then subsequently um, moving over to Hermes. But uh, she then um, found her true calling, returned to Thailand, moved into fine arts, architecture, and curation, uh, joining the Office of Architecture of the Fine Arts Department uh, in uh, late 2016, undertaking um, some key projects, including directing Wang Na Narumit 
an exhibition to teach people about the design and traditions of the National Museum, which actually was what uh, she told me is the front palace, uh, part of the uh, Grand Palace, which people do not realise. She said later that that whole experience um, actually uh, taught her about reaching out to young people and uh, making history accessible and coming up with ways that would um, connect uh, new generations with history. I think though one of her great achievements and possibly one of her biggest labours of love has been the immense work creating and producing a book and uh, a fantastic exhibition about King Rama V's visit to Norway in the early, early 20th century, 100 years between. Um, there are books uh, there you can have a look at. Um, there actually uh, not selling but have been donated to various including there's a copy donated to the Foreign Correspondents Club so you can leaf through it and um, uh, to without because Panu has already told you a bit about the book I think we'll start. Um, we'll start and over to you Kunmai. Hello it's very strange being able to oh god see yourself right in front of I mean <laughs> you can't avoid that. If you could speak closer to the microphone. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Is this okay? Yes, yeah. this is excellent. Okay, let me move. I'm right in between a barrier. When I started this project, actually, I'm not going to talk too much about the background because then we won't be able to talk about the content too much. And if you were able to go to the exhibition, we, it's basically a collaboration between the Fine Arts Department, myself, and the Foreign Ministry, because at the time they wanted to celebrate the 100 and, what is it, 15th year relationship between Norway and Thailand. So Du, who's sitting over there in the white blazer, who's very shy and did not want to talk, she is the one that asked me to join the project. And at the time, we didn't know how it would turn out and what, uh, if it was gonna be an exhibition or just a documentary. She says, I need your help in making the history about this relationship accessible and something that people can connect with. Because I don't know about you, but myself, I did not know that Norway and Thailand had such a long relationship and that King Rama V, my great-great-grandfather, was actually quite connected to the country and took quite a liking to it. And so we worked together and we ended up traveling for about 11 days and we ended up creating a, a documentary called A Week in, was it A Week in Norway? And then I created, they asked me to create an exhibition. They didn't think, they thought it would be in like a room in a hotel and I said, that's not how I function. And so I ended up working in situ at the old customs house, if you're familiar, that used to be in charge of customs. And it, the building itself is very fascinating, but we'll talk about it perhaps if there's a lecture another day because we want to get into the actual content. But we created, a, we created an exhibition that talked about not only my trip to Norway, but we're trying to find a way to kind of communicate his letter, his history, but try to intertwine his, his history with mine to make it a little bit more contemporary because a lot of people have done documentaries on his trip to Norway. However, I wanted to take the opportunity of being a family member to see if I can do a different take. So this King Joy, so he, this King, my great great grandfather traveled to Europe twice in 1887 and then 1897 and then in 1907 was it and so we're going to be focusing on the trip in 1907 when he spent a month in Norway but we're going to talk a little bit about what drove the trip and what drove him to go to Norway why it's such a significant trip for him because a lot of people talk about the other countries he's traveled to but they were surprised when they found out that he spent a month in Norway. So usually, this is a quote that I read my, my great-great-grandfather wrote in his letter on July 15th. So we chose four letters for this exhibition that were placed, uh, basically I wrote a few, three to four letters. There were four letters and they were meant to be reflections of his letters, although I didn't know at the time when I was writing it. So this was one of the letters he wrote 
which will, well, you can read, it says, I will narrate the whole story first, and then I will tell you where I visited first and afterwards, and this will make it easy to understand. This is better than moving back and forth because when I make a visit, I have to visit the destination then refer to the starting point. What I'm going to say will start from the beginning and move to the end. He's talking about his style of writing. So in this presentation, like what the talk we have today, although I want to, I'm going to talk about the exhibition, the centerpiece of the exhibition and the curatorial thinking, what is he feeling? And beyond the politics or the technology or the things that we know that he why he traveled to Norway. I wanted to find out on a personal level what he was thinking. You know, what, what is something that, if I read Gaiban, what is something that stands out to me as a topic that pops up, but people don't really pay attention to because we're more focused on the key events in history. So I was just trying to, what I was telling Gwen was that I was trying to t tell people that, you know, in history we have events, but we have things that tie the events together and drive events. So this is something that I was looking for when I was reading through all the papers of his trip to Norway, and I selected four letters. Based, and then I looked to see what was connecting all of the letters, and then I will tell you later what I ended up choosing as kind of the story behind the exhibition, which a lot of people were surprised at, which I was surprised they were surprised at, because if you read the, all of the letters, these were things that were all spoken about in every single letter. It was the common factor in all letters. And so if we're first gonna talk, begin with the final letter, which I had translated last. So in the letter, he actually writes, you know, he talks about, he, this is, he's writing to a start, if you're unfamiliar with this trip, these are a series of letters that he writes his daughters, as mentioned. And so this is the last letter before he goes into Thai territory, and he tells his daughter that uh, this will be the, f the final letter I write to you. Originally, when I started to write to you, I intended not to talk about official matters, and if I continue writing to you after I leave Gotma, the content of my correspondence will return to official matters. And so she says that he continues saying that this collection has been named Gaiban, but once we enter into Thai territory, we're no longer far away, so it's not suiting for the title anymore. And once we meet, there's no reason for the letters to connect us. And then he ends it by saying that, you know, it's quite, you know, he's quite sentimental. I didn't realize that was, my heart is beating quite rapidly as we're about to meet. The letters from your loving father. So what is the role that letters play in this exhibition and for the king? And why is it that can, he can only talk, why can't he talk about official matters or personal, why can't he talk about personal matters after you enter Thai territory? This is something I actually, in conversations with a literature professor who specializes in uh, His Majesty's letter, I actually asked him in conversation, why didn't he have to, why did he have to stop writing? Why did he have to return to official? Why can't he continue writing personal letters? And then he said, you know, a lot of it is that when you travel, it's kind of like how we all travel. We travel and when we do that, we're temporarily, you know, we are not released, but we're, S distance from the responsibilities that we have. It's a moment that we have to ourselves. It's a moment that we have to think, to contemplate, and to let go of responsibilities that we have at home. You know, he once he returned on Thai territory, he's a king again. So a lot of times these personal matters, it's not something that you can talk about anymore, but this also relates to the idea of how letters played a role in Thai society because we have to understand that letters served two purposes in Thailand in a over a hundred years ago. They were also official, so they were a form of documentation. So if the king were to give an order or even if the government were to give an order or to change laws or to do anything, it would be done in a letter format. So the king would give an order, he would write it through the letter or if you have an event that you're running like this event and you have to write a report about it, it would be documented through letter format. So this was the way things were conducted over a hundred years ago. And then you have a second category of personal letters. So in Thailand, this is very interesting because personal letters, 
you know, in the United States, we have debates, we, have, we talk in person, we exchange, but in Thailand, it's a little bit different. We have several kinds. We have, let's say, His Majesty, when he was talking to his brother, Prince Narit, they had a conversation about uh, the evolution of Buddhism in Thailand and the, the role that Mahayana uh, Buddhism played. And they just discussed this over letter format. This was going back and forth between brothers, talking about academic and philosophical debate. And this is not the only time he, this takes place. If you go to the exhibition recently, I think the Komsila Paka and the Fine Arts Department had an exhibition focused on the letters that, were, that took place between him and Prince Tamlong, which is another one of his brothers that did a lot of the historical work in Thailand. And they talked about arc, they talked about history and archeology. span So in Thailand, a lot of things were conducted this way. And when I did the front palace, I found letters between King Mongkut and his brother, the second king. And they would talk to each other intimately and personally, but it was a way to kind of report on what was going on between each other's palaces. So it was kind of a mix of personal and public, but this is how, what the letters roles served, and you see this a lot over 100 years ago. And so for the king himself, you have that kind of philosophical exchange, and you also have documentation, travel, let's say a travel log that you see, let's say with his two months that he spent in Java, which is a documentation of his time there, what he saw, who he, who he met, and it was a form of documentation. But for Gaiban, this was very different because the tone was different. The person receiving the letter was different. When you read Gaiban, it's different from all the letters that he wrote previously because it contained a lot of emotions. It contained, it revealed a lot of the, what kind of writer he was and what kind of person he was as a result and his personal viewpoints. And in Thailand at the time, you know, knowing what a king thinks, you know, or what any public figure thinks is quite, you know, it's an unknown. People don't really know. They think it's something that you can't quite touch. And this was something I really tried to address when I did this exhibition and even when I did the front palace. I wanted something like this because you, something doesn't stay alive unless you talk about it, unless you, you remember it. This is something very important. So I wanted to make this something people can remember. And these letters contain things that people, and emotions that everybody feels, homesickness when you miss someone, when you see something and it reminds you of your family members. He talks about, we were talking about earlier that there was at one point he started missing the food in Thailand and so he was complaining about the food in Norway. I mean, he was kind of in a bad mood that day, but <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was really missing the food in Thailand. So someone gave him salmon and what he did is that he ended up making a, a porridge, a Thai rice porridge with salmon, which usually we don't have salmon in, in that dish. So it was a funny integration of Norwegian culture. And so you see things in this letter that you wouldn't normally have access to and you wouldn't be able to see in official documents. This is the power that letters possess. And it's almost like you're reading it and this memory, this moment, and this action is distilled. This memory is temporarily distilled. This is what makes letters so powerful because when you read it, you feel that it's present, it's here, it's right now. So this is important to discuss because in the U I know in the US we don't have so much distinction between the letters that like what letters served back then in Thailand it makes a big difference. And so something that I went through when I read those letters as I said is I tried to find something that was a bit in between. Not something people thought about. So with the final letter I'm going to with all the letters, I'm going to kind of bring out quotes and kind of talk about it a little bit. So something that he talks about, which is very interesting, which is his contemplation on this idea of human aspiration. And a lot of people ask why I would start with this first and why not talk about the trip and then talk about this, because this is relevant. This is very relevant to how and why he traveled abroad. and. I didn't read this letter until I finished the exhibition. But what's very interesting is that what I discovered is that when I read all the letters and I took this trip and I created this curatorial, what he said and what he was thinking was exactly what I was feeling that he, the reason why he took his trip. I wanted to know why he did it. 
Like, yes, you have to, you go and find technology, but we're driven by many things. We're human beings. We're driven by, uh, yes, innovation, but we, to an analyze the human condition is something that, or figure out why people do that, or why did people do this to me, or why did I do that? This is something that everybody, regardless of who they are, think of. And so when he talks about Europe, this is like at the end, he reflected on his trip and he says, you know, a lot of people asked me what I thought about Europe and it's gonna differ from person to person as anything. However, for me, it's too vast. And I remember asking, I was like, what do you mean too vast? And he said that, and I'm sorry for the Europeans in the room, but he says that he feels like it's, they've lost what's good for, for them. Nothing can further be developed, whether it be orchards, fields, forests, and plantations. They have been fully cultivated and developed. And no one can make a living anymore. And he said at this point, what is happening is that people are expanding. They go and settle in America, Australia. They have fought to dominate African countries and intervene in parts of Asia. And this is the reason, but you know, before we take a negative outlook on this quote, bear with me, we'll talk about it a bit more. It's not as negative as we think it is. But he says very interestingly is that this is normal for human beings. They do not easily succumb to extinction. Not only will they not be easily defeated, but they will acquire as much as possible to ensure their gains will be secure and endless. So he talks and he says this is the nature of human aspiration. And then he continues and he talks about how, you know, the people have this natural desire when you, it's this natural instinct to survive. And we're not gonna about analyze this comment yet until we talk about the history behind this trip because I think it will give you some light into why he said this. And then we'll talk, he actually adds positive comments to this statement, there are, it's not just a, com a negative, it's not negative. However, we were gonna have to first talk about why, what brought him to the point where he took this trip and perhaps said some of these initial comments. But I really think when I looked at that letter, something that really struck me was how contemplative it was. It was sad. I thought it was sad. And when I spoke to someone, I said, you know, I feel sad. I'm sad when I read it. And he's like, it's not sad. Don't think about it like that. Even if you think it's sad, you're misunderstanding. And then we'll talk about that after. So when we're, this is the exhibition on the third floor. So I was supposed to show this when I was talking about letters, but I got so distracted by the conversation I had with myself that um, I decided to not. But this is the first level. And so we showed three, four of his letters. And this is after going up through the exhibitions, I have letters on each floor, are my letters to him. And if you notice and you're able to read through the four letters we have from him on the third floor, you'll notice that they kind of reflect each other. They're in parallel. They're conversations with each other, but they're kind of tied to each other in some way. So we'll talk about the curatorial later, but this is what it looked like. And people can sit and read, and unfortunately there wasn't much time at the time, but we, there was, it was still a good moment for a lot of people. So when we try to analyze his comments a bit in the final letter, we do have to talk about the politics at the time. What drove him to take that initial trip to Europe? And what is it that drove him to take the second one? And this is something that's very important to talk about. Yes, I'm talking about Norway, but why is he there? Why did he go on this big trip for eight months away from home? This is something I really wanted to know. And so I looked into it. I talked to people who specialize in Thai history. And what a lot of it is, is that you have to really talk about the socio-political situation that led up to the trigger event, which I call the trigger event, which is the Bak Nam incident. And actually, this incident took place in 1893 in July. However, it was a series of events that led up to this. So something that I'm very interested in doing is that I wanted to understand his mindset. So what was going on in his brain? How did he feel about it? And how could it have affected his mental state? What, and so a lot of the times when we look at it, this is a bit of a political strategy. 
when we think, because when th all the events took place, which events took place that possibly would have been of concern to him? What was his response to each event? And what was his feeling when the incident in, 19, in 1893 actually took place? And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. If we see this map was the one I found that's probably the most similar to what it looked like after this incident in 1893, when Thailand lost territory to the French. And so this is the most similar. It changed a little bit in the early 1900s. They lost a bit more territory, but this is probably the most accurate. And so it kind of begins in 1858, if you look in French Indochina. At the time, the French were pretty involved in Vietnam, what would be Vietnam here. And so they were involved because there was French missionaries that went into the area. And so in 1858, 1859, it was, in 1858 it was briefly united under the Nguyen dynasty until the French went into uh, in Vietnam, and they went under the pretenses that there was, they needed to go in to protect the rights of its missionaries who were being persecuted and being sent out of the country. And I rem this is something that the Nguyen dynasty at the time, they saw the missionaries as a really big threat. And so they were persecuted and they were sent out of the country. So during that time, the, um, the French sent military, they sent people into Da Nang, which was unsuccessful, and then they go, and then there was a battle that kind of raged between Da Nang and then you have in Saigon. And so finally, after many years, it wasn't, they didn't, they actually succeeded in capturing Saigon in 1859, but not the periphery until 1862, in which they signed the Treaty of Saigon. And in this treaty, Vietnam concedes uh, and they legalize the practice of the Catholic faith, and they also allow uh, trade within the Mekong Delta. This is something the king would have been looking at because in 1893, it doesn't look so different to what happens before. So he's looking at all this, you know, as a king or as someone who's ruling a country, in order to maintain your territory, what is going on around, because eventually it'll come to me. So the Treaty of Sukan, they actually, in, in addition to the heavy fine, they conceded like th three provinces. And this is when they started to build Cochin China that you, see, that you see. And not long after that, you'll, the king will see that in 1893, Cambodia signs a treaty with the French, and it becomes a French protectorate. So in the past, this was actually a vassal state. And so when they went in and they established this as a protector, what does that mean? It's not completely colonization in its full, like, f what it m means is that you have the, you know, the domestic and the trade policy is managed by the French, and then in return they get, they get military protection because they were concerned about, the, at the time, the Vietnamese and the Thais were coming in. So this was something he would have been looking at. And he saw what happened because between that time before the French were able to secure the north of Vietnam in the battle with the Chinese, they saw that over the years they consolidated the power, the French consolidated the power in the region, in China and in, in Cambodia. They did reforms and they lowered the power of the monarchy to be in name and they did it so there were cultural assimilation programs and so he would have seen that also and this was a concern and not long after that this is when we start getting into the incident in 1885 they established the french established a consulate in luang prabang so laos looks a bit different back then than it does now Long Pabang was a kingdom, so there was a lot of kingdoms. So Thailand was, this is another conversation, but you know, at the time, Laos wasn't the, the country that you see today, it was several kingdoms. And so you have Long Pabang, Champasak. So these were vassal kingdoms of Thailand at the time. And so when they established the consulate in 1885, the king was like, wait a minute, I know what you're doing. This is very, so he was concerned. So when you, at the time when I'm looking at all this information, 
I wanted to see, you know, in his head, it's like watching, it's trying to imagine someone playing chess. And what game, how, what was occurring and how are you gonna respond? He, they do that and the biggest, the next thing that happened was Auguste Pavie, he was, he came in and he played a big role during the conflict in Vietnam. He became vice consul at the end of 1886 and he went in to explore the possibility of Laos becoming part of French Indochina. And so this was occurring, and so they, by that time, he was looking, and the Siamese were beginning to get really worried, you know. And then you have several small events. You have, after they secured, they officially established French Indochina in 1860, in 1867, and this was quite significant. Well, it, this happened in 1867. At the same time, not by accident, I would say, the Siamese and uh, the king recognized the Cambodian protectorate. They said, okay, we'll recognize this, and in return, the French allowed them to keep, or they conceded, the area around Angkor Wat, Angkor Wat and Siem Reap area. And this was done, I think, on purpose in order to deter the French from coming any close, from, from moving in anymore. But not long after that, they did. The French did push it a bit more. And when the, they had some rebels from the north of Vietnam that came in that the French helped. And so there was various incidences. And they took advantage of the weaknesses in the, in the area. And the king of Long Phabang ended up signing. And in about 1889, they signed a protectorate and wanted to be part of the protectorate of France. And, the, and at that time, Siam said, no, no more. We're not doing that. We refuse to do that. And this is when things really start, and this is how we really move into what goes on with the Baknam incident. Because we start to see that in 1892, three merchants and French merchants were sent, were sent out of Thailand, Siam, for supposed opium smuggling. And then you have uh, the, cons the consul at the time who committed suicide. And, and so what happened is that all of these factors came together and Auguste Pavi, what he ended up doing is he used it to kind of stroke tensions, to take advantage of the weakness that was occurring in the area. So, you know, at first I was trying to think if I was gonna talk about all this, but then it actually becomes quite significant. Because in 1892, when you, this happened, 1893, after the consul commits suicide, Auguste Pavie becomes the French consul. And in 1892, after he commits suicide, after everything, what he does in, is he tells the Siamese that you have to evacuate all your military posts east of the Mekong River, military and administrative. This is an ultimatum and concede and recognize this as part of the French Indochina. The, the Siamese said no. They said no, and part of it was something they thought they would have support from the British, which they eventually won't, but they said no. And they not only said no, they reinforced their administrative and military posts. And so what the French did in response is they sent the Navy, they sent the military up to the disputed area and there was a conflict in which a police, com a police commissioner, it was someone, it was a central figure who died. And this was the impetus for what we know as the Baknam incident. This incident is very, very important. And so in 1893, what ends up happening is that after they refused to evacuate their posts, the French ships were sent up the Mekong River without the permission of the Siamese. They met with fire from the fort. At Bak Nam, by the way, is the mouth of the river. That's what it means in Thai. So they met with uh, resistance, but they pushed through and they made it to Bangkok. And then a big battle occurred. And a central character in our story will play a big role in this conflict, which is he's a, he's a Danish admiral who was given the Thai name of Paya Chonayut. He worked for the Thai government and was vice admiral of the Thai Navy and he worked for the king for 27 years before retiring. He played a role in this battle 
which the Siamese lost quite badly. And July 13th, what ends up happening, you know, if you can imagine, is the king comes out of his palace and the French Navy, the French boats have their cannons aimed right at the palace. They were given an ultimatum. You have to concede territories east of the Mekong River, pay a three million franc fine, and then you have to give punishment to the people who actually caused all the, who were the, the reason for, whoever was behind the killing of the police, of the individual during the conflict in 1892, in 1893. They refused, the Siamese refused initially, and His Majesty the King actually went to the British and asked for help. They asked for help, please help. The British said, give the French what they want. Give them Laos and in turn give us, you know, the, the, I think the Shan state they were giving north of the country. And this, I, at the time when I was learning about this, I kept wondering, if, you're, if this was your country, what would you feel? How would you, f what, what would this drive you to do? At the end, they gave in and they ended up giving up. They signed the treaty in, late, in October, paid a heavy fine gave territories east of the Mekong River, that's Laos, and this is where Indo French Indochina became complete with the addition of Laos, and later on, you'll see in 1902, 1904, they actually get the kingdom of Champasak also, and Trat. And they were able to go into, if anyone's been to Jantaburi, they were, they were given temporary control over Jantaburi as well. So this is something that was quite significant so when we return to the letter, I actually wondered, what was he feeling during this conflict? All the things after years of strategy, political strategy, and then to come to the point where you have two cannons aimed at your house and you have to pay a fine and you're at threat of losing so much, and you lost all this territory, when will it stop? And so he ended up, this is something that he actually said This situation really weighed on him, and he actually wrote in Pom Pot Nung. He wrote about the Baknam incident, that he was really discouraged, and he actually said that he wanted to die. However, even if he were to die, people would say that he was a king that was unable to protect his own nation. And so Prince Damlong, his brother, wrote in return, saying, you know, he writing a letter saying, Right now, the nation is like a boat in the middle of a storm, and all the seamen, the rowers, are ready to take up the responsibilities and the orders from the captain. And if the captain loses his faith or dies, then the boat will overturn and sink. This is what he was feeling at the time. So when we return to the letter, you know, of course, this gives a very dramatic, you know, how upset he was, and this is what, if, you would think that this would certainly affect kind of confirm my suspicions that the final letter was very sad and indeed angry and sad. But when I talked to the literature professor, he said, please don't think that. It's not sad. We have to remember in Thai literature, in fact, this is how Thais write. Thais, uh, we say in Thai, Chok Doi Di, which means we have the ending is meant to be serene. It's meant to be a reflection, a contemplation. It's not angry. It's not. It's meant to end well. So this is something you have to be aware of when you're looking at this style. It's very Thai in nature, and so to look at it, you read the letter initially, and you could say that was his feeling prior, but it it wasn't. And so, you know, it's very interesting that because he actually goes on in the letter, if you, talk, if you read it, he goes on to talk about innovation, that when people are seeking to survive, they actually, in their, with this instinct, they push and they push, and it's like the human mind. And he ends up saying that, you know, Europe is so innovative, and they're so innovative because in this kind of fight for survival, people are pushing boundaries, and they're thinking outside the box, and they have to, and they, you know, it's human nature to try to, 
you know, when you create ideas and you keep innovating and re-innovating and re-innovating, when you hit that wall, you start all over again. This is human nature and you, as a result, you create really, really amazing things. And he ended up saying that it's amazing. What they've created is amazing. From steam, from the power of steam, from steam power to what we see in hydropower in Norway, he said he would have never thought in his lifetime he would have seen something like that. He said that the possibility of the human mind is endless. And what the, so at the end of the day, is it sad? No, it's not. It's a reflection. And basically, is he saying Europe is bad? No, he's not. He's saying at the end of this letter that you know, they're human like all of us. We all have this sense of human aspiration. And in Thai, when we translate that word, it means human desire, actually. You know, we have these human desires to survive and to create and to, to innovate and re-innovate and to push boundaries, you know. And so it's just, it's easy to look at that first part and think about it that way. But when you actually understand it as a whole, we have to remember exactly how people write and culturally how people think. And so he just said that, you know, Europe is just like us. We're all human. And in this fight for survival, it's driven them to do both good and bad. This is basically what he means in this last paper. So when we talk about human aspiration, why am I talking so much about this? Why did I talk? Everyone's probably panicking right now because I'm talking so much about this. It's because it, I think it's really what is in the back of his mind when he was traveling in Norway. What drives people to do what they do? What drives me? What drives him? This is what I wondered when I read this. What is his aspiration? And what did he feel? What did he want out of this? And what are his goals? And I think as him, as someone who's very interested in the human condition, you'll see this if you read his letters, this is something that he's, this is why he talks a lot about hydropower and how people survive, the resilience of Norwegian people and about things like that. And so this is something that I really think was the backbone and maybe something that was behind what he did. And so he was naturally very, content, like when you read his letters, he's a king, but he was actually quite, contemplated when he went to Europe, it allowed him a lot of time with his thoughts. And it allowed him to be away from his position as a king just for a moment. And when you're human, not human, but when you're just yourself and you don't have to think about other people, other things, you focus on what drives you and how you can survive. And so this was something that I found very important to talk about because this was something that drove this exhibition uh, unknowingly, and I think that it was something that drove, drives everyone. This letter was not sad, but human beings were driven, this is what makes us great, is this push and this ambition. So we're going to go into the exhibition itself. There is a lot that took place in between, however, we don't have much time. <laughs> he, the, his initial trip, just to summarize, was because he was uh, basically trying to find allies. He knew after Baknam incident that he needed to find allies in order to maintain his territory. He found the allies in the Tsar in Russia, and then he went through Europe, and then he was able to garner respect for that moment. So when we talk about this trip that we're going to be talking about now in 1907, what was it for? It's for recuperation and for relaxation. He went to Germany a lot of times for his health. And so by the time that he went to Norway, he went for a couple of reasons, I think. First, he went because of um, you know, his, you know, the admiral that we talked about during the incident, Bagnam incident, the Danish admiral. He actually had stock, he had, to, he, he, he knew people that were in Norsk Hydro. So at the time in the late 19th century, early 20th century, this was a very big, uh, the, the location, Norway was a really, really big location for exploring hydropower. And so this played a big role during that time. And they created a beta version of 
uh, a technology utilizing hyd hydropower to create fertilizer. And this was as an agricultural nation that King was, was interested in. But he was also interested in other things. So when I went through the letters, something that became quite obvious at the time was that he wrote a lot about nature. And so this became the core of the exhibition in terms of there are two parts of the exhibition, which is when we talk about, when he talks about nature, he talks about it as something that is so much, big, it, it, it has this kind of duality of being so harsh and so, you know, so scary and so, you know, it's something that can affect your livelihood in your life and it's something that's capable of so many things good and good and bad, but it also contains a lot of beauty. And in all the, in this duality, it's something that uh, it, you have to respect and you're humbled by. So this is something that he talks a lot about a lot. This whole idea about nature as something that's so grand and it's so beautiful and it's something that seems otherworldly, it's something that seems so harsh and so frightening, but it's also something that you have to respect and you know that it comes before you. And so we ended up talking about that. And so I was gonna talk about, so Norway was very, this is the historic route. And so when I was trying to evaluate these themes, I looked into the relationship between the two countries and I tried to think about, you know, why is it that he connected to Norway so much? And it's because at the time, Norway had just been, like two years prior, had become an independent kingdom, right? They got their independence after being in a union with Sweden for over 400 years. Not, no, no, over a few centuries, they're with Denmark for 400 years. And then after the Napoleonic Wars, they were in a union with Sweden. And before that, they were in the, a union with Sweden and, and Norway, and, and Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. So when we're talking about all of this, when this new king was crowned in Norway in 1905, they said that this was the first, they had their own king for the first time in over 500 years. Because when this union was established in, in 1397 with all the Scandinavian countries, it was united over, over, under one king. And when it enters into the union with Denmark, it was under the kingdom, the administration and the royalty was based in Copenhagen. So this was the first time. So when the king went to Norway, it was a special moment where they were kind of at a similar point historically. What both fighting for their independence. And so this was something that connected them considerably. But we're gonna go directly into this because if we talk about the history, it would take much longer. So the theme of the first floor is the different facets of the nature. This is something that was a common theme throughout all the letters. And so basically when I was designing, I was really inspired by his style of writing which is very Thai. What do I mean by very Thai? It's very rich and full of imagery, very rich in descriptors. And the intention is to bring people on a journey with you. If you ever read Thai literature, it's very descriptive <laughs> and it's very experiential. And it's intended though, that almost like you can walk in the shoes of whoever you're reading the, the book. This is Thai style writing. And so the king himself had a very keen sense of storytelling that really made you feel that you were being kind of swallowed up by nature, that you're walking in and nature is something that is overwhelming and it's bigger than you and it humbles you and it's larger and it's something that almost envelops you like you're in a cocoon. This is the way his writing looked at the time, which was very interesting. And I wanted to give you an example because it will give you an idea of what he means by that. And then we'll talk about, this will lead into the discussion of the, the design. And so uh, through his letters, especially the ones on July 9th and July 15th, he talks about a lot about nature and about water. And so on July 9th, he's actually on the way up to North Cape. So this is in northern, this is in northern Norway, which at the time there was travel in Norway, but it was primarily the fjord region. And so when he went up to Norway and he went to this area at the time, 
it on the 9th, he would have been around uh, Torcotton Island. So he describes when he was on the land, he went on a walk. He got off an island in northern Norway. And he describes, he says, an old woman and her son takes them walking up along the rocks, which is, were jagged and some were covered with grass. The grass is soft and spongy because underneath the turf, he describes that there are old roots mixed with the dirt of reddish black color. And you can actually take this turf up and if you were to burn it, it would, the fire, the heat would be very, very intense and even more intense than if you were to burn roots. And he said with, in the grass that grows, it's not thick, it's short, not long. The woman said it rained yesterday and this morning. As such, the water was permeating the ground. He had to walk on the rocks to walk up. The higher up he gets, the, it changed the landscape. And this is what you see throughout his letters. He will always say that, that it's almost like a movie. It's like a painting. When you walk up and it changes so quickly from being grass to going up to rock, to nothing to the point where all you see is white moss or what I saw which is this kind of like looks like cotton and it happens so dramatically and so quickly so when we went to the upper part the moss looked like papier I don't know how to say in Thai it's kind of like this how do you describe papier it's like this kind of looks like a herb or kind of purslane he said but their leaves are growing in the crevices of the rock and there's no more grass. And the moss is growing up and they pile on top of each other They look like carpets. And he says that when he looked down at the sea, he could see the islands beautiful and the beautiful sea in between. I did not want to walk any further and I felt exhausted. I stopped midway and the sunlight was so strong that it made me sweat. Others continued on and I had to wait for so long for them to return. Normally, in normal situations, you wouldn't be able to get this kind of, you know, I wouldn't say weakness, but he, emotion of knowing that a king, you know, that you as a king or as a public figure that you're weak, that you feel weak, that you feel tired. So the fact that he was able to kind of put that into the text, it added a bit more humanity to the story. It was very descriptive, but you're walking in his shoes and you're walking up as the landscape changes and then you can't walk anymore because it's too hard. I can't do it anymore. My health doesn't allow me to. He gets back on the boat. We'll return to this story at the end. But he gets back on the boat, and he looks out the wetter, weather, and the water looks like the painting of Norwegian towns, which would never, you'd never see in real life. The air is much clearer than usual. And the sun sets at 11 o'clock p.m. because it's the midnight sun. He says the white air looked, the, he described throughout his letters that not only it looks like the movie, but the air had, had almost an ethereal color. It's nothing like you would see in Thailand, he said. So much clearer and so more otherworldly that he's seen in, in Thailand. And this is something that he, he spoke about in several letters and that he was so impressed by. And why do I tell this story? It sounds like a normal letter, but I think what struck, struck me about his writing was that it kind of reminded me of when I did the project on Korn last year. When I was trying to figure out how the ritual orchestra worked, I asked a music specialist and I said, what is the role of each instrument? And he, he she told me, you have the kong yai, the, you know, the gongs. This acts as the tempo and then you have the xylophone, and you have the xylophone in a higher pitch and a lower pitch. The, the higher pitch one, she describes, is almost like if you compare it to a, a building, a, like a foundation, you're building a house. Kong Wong Yai is like the columns. This is just her interpretation, right? And she says, the Renat egg is like the bricks. The B, the ob oboe, is like the you know, the, the cement or what you would do to tie all the bricks together. And the Renatum, I said, what about that one? This is the lower pitch. And she said, that one has complete freedom to move and go, move to and fro as it, as it pleases. It's almost like a veil that hangs over 
You know, it's like the emotion. So when I'm looking at his text, a lot of it felt like, like this. You have the events that act like the columns. You have the, mo these moments of weaknesses and things like these little moments that he experiences that acts like his emotions that act as things like glue the, t the, the bricks together. And I felt like there was almost this veil over his stories, this feeling, this kind of melancholic, this nostalgic feeling throughout his writing. And this is something that I thought I really wanted to emulate when I designed. And I think this was the reason when you read, it's so um, experiential, and it's something that really makes you, touches you on a certain level, because there is that bill, what is it? And it's such a random like comparison, but that's exactly what I thought of when I thought of the way he writes. You see it a bit more clearly on the, fi on the 15th, in the same region, actually. In this one, he talks actually a bit more about water and about the surroundings. He went into the he went in to see the troll fjord, and he says he's walk he goes in and he's surrounded by mountain ranges as if the the mountains were created to sur to surround like the mountains and the landscapes actually existed for the water in which it's surrounded. The mountain caps have become pointed like this also because of the water that exists around. The grass on the surface of the plains and the mountain crevices are a dull green color. Almost like she said, compared it to a lichen. And the rocks were eroded by the water to form the shape of petals. Each petal is gigantic beyond estimation. These mounds were sources of spring, both large and small, that flowed everywhere. Large springs gushed down from the deep crevices in great for with great force. I wanted to take a picture, but I missed my chance. He finishes. On our way to the fjord, the cold wind from the snow-capped mountain was chilly, and Chai Urupong, his son, his beloved son, said it almost made him shiver. You know, when I read these things, this is a way of right. I, I was really, you know, I actually really liked his writing a lot. I was really inspired by the way he wrote for the reasons that I told you, the method of writing that was so not only descriptive, but actually felt like it consisted of layers surrounded by layers and with the veil of something that was a bit more emotional to it and powerful. And so when I was trying to create the exhibition, I wanted to create that also. And so this is a road, this is, I'm gonna give you some examples here. So this was the historic route across the mountain to get to the fjord region. In fact, him and I, this is one of the few places we actually overlapped in. This is a photo that he, t that was taken of his party going across this historic mountain route to the fjord region. This is the photo I took of the same road. This was used in the exhibition. Almost the same, right? Didn't change that much. But of course, I will talk about the coloring. A lot of people came up to me and actually said that it must have been really cold. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, part of it was something I manipulated in the post-production, but this was something I was going for, not necessarily a feeling of cold, but a feeling of nostalgia, a feeling of melancholy, a feeling of walking and going into nature and feeling that like the king expresses in his writing, it's like a moving picture that changes with each step. And that when you actually enter nature, you feel that it's something that surrounds you, envelops you, and you feel like it's a bit supernatural in a way. Not supernatural, I don't like using that word, especially in Thailand, but a bit powerful. So these are all photos I took on my Nikon FM2 with the Portra 400. So this is the same route, and you'll notice that as you go, the landscapes start to change. This was taken. We did not adjust this photo that much. This was the photo as taken, maybe a bit of an adjustment in the color tone. But it was a very cold. It was a very cold day, very chilly, very very windy. The weather was very unpredictable. And this is the photo that I took, and it was very similar to his description. How water seems to cut and shape the landscape in the lands. 
and it creates this feeling when you look at the photo doesn't it look like a painting it looks like a painting just like when he was saying that it looks like the painting in like Norwegian paintings that were so popular in the 19th century that don't seem real This photo we did not adjust. This was what we, this is as it was taken. At this point, as you travel along the road, grass gives way to rocks. And like he says, mosses. I noticed this kind of, the only flowers left were this kind of look like cotton. It changed so quickly along this route. And this was the final the view looking over the fjord region. I took this with the Hasselblad. This was not the king's, someone asked me, it was not the king's pho photos. So we took this. So when we talk about the design, we have to return to what he said. He talks a lot about how the landscape looks like a movie, a movie picture. And it looks like those kind of Norwegian landscape painting. What is he talking about? What does he mean by that, a Norwegian landscape painting? And if you go back in history a little bit in Norway, in the union with Denmark, the two places that was, was the duration was for over 400 years. A lot of people felt it was kind of like a brain drain during that time, because during that time, the center of administration, royalty, and culture, art, took place in Copenhagen. And at the time, Norway kind of was, not the lesser, but it was, didn't take a top priority role at that time. So they felt a lot of the arts was left at the wayside during that time. So during the union with Sweden, we see this rise in the mid to late 19th century of this movement called natural romanticism. And what it is, is it, is it puts this emphasis on national consciousness, the sense of national identity, Norwegian identity, and this emphasis on the aesthetics of Norwegian landscape. And you know, at the most, you know, at the end, what they want to do is evoke this sense of nostalgia. And so what you see a lot of this is you see this kind of revival of the literature, the arts, uh, language, and even pa especially painting. An example of this is by Johan Dahl here. And this is an example of his paintings. A lot of their photo of the paintings at the time were in the fjord region, and they were meant to be ethereal, romantic, of course, and you know it's meant to evoke this sense of national pride and national consciousness, as I said. And it was ethereal, ethereal, and it didn't look real. When you look at it, you see this beautiful light, and you see everything blurred. It looks exactly almost like the photo that we took in Norway. That's what it reminded me of and what the king was describing in his letters, not just one, but several. He said it many times when he was shifting in landscape. He said it looks exactly, the light doesn't look real, just like in these portraits. It has this otherworldly sense to it that although it has this kind of harshness to it, like you see in the letter on July 15th, this harshness and this element that makes uh, Prince Urapong have chills down his spine. It also has this sense of beauty, you know, this sense of, you know, you're not in this, it's not a, in the world that we exist in now, not the physical. Here's another. And this kind of movement resulted in a lot of artists moving to the Fjord region, creating artwork kind of like this. This is, my, this is what we used in the exhibition. This is for the first floor. So the goal of the first floor is I say, I want people, just like his writing, to experience the exact same feeling. When you walk into the room, I told the lighting designer and I told everyone, I want people to feel like it envelops you. I want them to feel like you're walking and is experiencing it, you are experiencing this, and when you're walking in, the, it doesn't feel real. You're almost elevated into this other, Plan. I know this sounds crazy, but this is what I wanted people to feel because this is what I believe His Majesty felt at the time. And when you feel this way, you feel small, you feel like uh, a character in, in the story, which is nature. And so this photo is quite funny because this is the first photo we installed in the site, we selected for the site, but it's the last photo I took on my trip and it didn't even take place anywhere the king went. 
And you'll notice all the, most of the photos I took were not in the same position as, as the king. Um, but it was actually in a park in Oslo. I, took, I veered off the path and I walked in and I felt this feeling and I took a photo. What we ended up doing is we printed it on, we did the printing on an acrylic, very large size, and we hung it here. It's actually much larger, in per it was much larger in person. So this site, you know, the Customs House is a historic space that dates from the late 19th century. But when they did the archeological work for the site, because now they're gonna be converting it to a hotel space, what they discovered in the archeological dig was what you see is the foundation. And they discovered that it was actually a foundation for an old Chinese home that preceded the customs house. So when we saw the site, we wanted people to see it because the goal was to see different layers in history, both past, present, and you know my experience. And so when people walked into the room, we wanted people to see this, and we want people to experience how light played with the acrylic and how it changed the photo from morning to night, which it changed. Because the lighting designer actually went into the site and sat all day looking at how the light hits. And we didn't turn on the lights until about 4 or 5 p.m. So this is the natural light, actually, that you're seeing now come in. And we saw it as a form of dialogue with the structure. So when a lot of people came into this floor and they walked into this room, they said it was their favorite room because they said it felt like they were in a different space. So when, we took, when I took some students through this, this exhibition, the goal was to, I actually asked them this, and when I told the lighting designer what I wanted, they asked me, what do you want? What is one word that will describe how you want this exhibition? And I said, melancholy. Not nostalgic, I don't want nostalgic. I want melancholy. And they're like, what do you mean? And I said, you know, I want people to feel like when you walk within this space, there's something that you feel is there, but you can't touch it, and you miss it. This is how you work in the heritage field. And so this is something I wanted to create. This is part of the reason we created like this and why I liked his writing style so much because it created this experience and I aided in the process by I worked with the design and with the photos and if you look back at the photos the tone is quite similar I was talking to someone who I said I controlled the tone very I printed all the photos out until all the colors of the photos were adjusted and matched perfectly. And the reason was I wanted to create a cool tone, a sense of melancholy and yeah, a bit of nostalgia. This is very important because this is how you create uh, an emotion in someone without in intention. This was very important for me. So although the photos were already cool toned, we enhanced it a little bit. And we wanted to be a bit ethereal, obviously. So when people walked into this room, they, they said instantly. So these, stu so these students, I asked them, okay, I'm not gonna go bring you up. I want you to go through the exhibition and then tell me the word you felt when you walked through at the end. And these are first year design students, like very hard to control. They like went everywhere and I, I had to really yell for them to come back. And it was really like scary. But at the end they came back and I asked them, how did you feel? They're quiet. I asked one girl, how did you feel? Sad, which was the right response. It's what I wanted them to feel. But sad isn't, you know, it's like in the first paper, sad isn't necessarily bad. What it means is there's something that you know that you miss. It's nostalgic, but it's a bit of a more deeper feeling that I was trying to get at. So this was something I was really, really going for when I was designing. And I really focused on do integrating this feeling through lighting design, how I did the post-production on the photos, and what paper I used, how we hanged everything. And you'll see photos of the exhibition a little bit at the end to see how it turned out. And I wanted it to be as light, as much as possible attuned to the structure 
which was also a cool tone. I wanted it to have some kind of interweaving of the both of the stories. This is why we did the hanging this way. This is why the color tones were partially the way it were. So at the end, what, when you ask yourself, well, how did it make him feel when he walked through nature, when he experienced all of this? It's actually the same as how I felt when I went to Norway. I felt like, gosh, this is so much bigger than me. I feel humbled. He felt humbled. He felt like there are things that he didn't expect to feel. Like in the July 9th letter, he climbs up, the, he climbs up and he finds it's a way, it's part of this kind of search for this, what his aspiration, what who he is. He goes up and he, after years of, of kind of stress, I would say, you, he went to Norway and he was able to relax and actually be who he was and wanting to in explore and be adventure. And he actually admits his weaknesses, his fears. And these are things you uniquely find in letters and not in documents, but in letters. And so you see him feel, I'm tired. I don't know if I can do this. And in the second place you see it is in North Cape, which he actually was able to climb on July 12, 1907. So this site is almost the very north of Norway. And at the time, although people were traveling to Norway, it was mainly the fjord region. If you're able to go up to the north and North Cape, you had to have quite a bit of money because it was very expensive. It took a very long time. It took me a long time, even though I'm in, I was in 2019. You know, it, it takes a while and you have to take a boat and then he had to climb about 40 minutes up the side of the cliff up. And he said at the time when he went up, he said, he gets to the Hornavikin Bay and he says to Paya Choniyut, I don't know if I can do this. I really don't think I can do this. And you would never expect someone in any position, political or, or royalty or anyone, you wouldn't think, because you don't think that they, you, you don't normally have access to this kind of feeling. But he said, I don't think I can do this. This is too much, this is bigger than me. I can't. Everyone says, yes, you can. It's just like during the Baknam, is it? Yes, you can. You can do it. And so he had a bunch of seamen. He had a carpenter, and they actually helped carry him up part of the way because he's not in very good health. And then he had to walk up the steep parts. And when he gets to the top, it's very, he looks out and he actually says, it rained so much during the, his trip, similar to my trip. And he said this day was the only day he was actually able to see clearly the midnight sun. Of his whole trip, this was the most clear. This was the most clear of his whole trip. This was my trip, which, was not clear like his. And so I actually enjoyed the weather more. This is our walk up. We took the same route as he did, which was quite easy actually. It was only 40 minutes and <laughs> do was it easy. She was having a bit of a hard time, but it was, it, I felt it was quite easy at the time. And they still have the iron railings from when he was there. And the reason this is so important to do, I wanted to, to do it, because I said you need to experience it the way that people experienced it back then, because this is how you can understand how he feels. And so this is on the boat. This was something that made me think of him, actually, because when I read his letters, he actually said that he made a quote that rem reminded me of this situation, so I took a photo. He said on the way back, he, from North Cape, he arrived at the front of the island with lots of birds and they blew a whistle because they, before that they had fired a gun with no, nothing occurred. When they blew the whistle, the birds emerged in great numbers. And then he said at the end that I can feel the sharp cold weather and he said it was so cold it was 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees centigrade, not that cold. but. It reminded me exactly like this. So when I, when I took photos during that time, it wasn't necessarily to emulate exactly what he was seeing, but I was trying to find a way of how to integrate, to find connections between our experiences, even if they weren't in the same location. Something that you see throughout his letters, which I don't know if do you noticed, 
but I questioned a lot. This is before he actually went to see the hydropower plants in, in the south. But he uses hydropower a lot through his letters in locations that don't actually harness water for electricity. So I was wondering a lot of times, what does he mean by that? So this is something that I tried to evaluate. So what is hydropower exactly? So hydropower is actually this tech, it exists even before the uh, steam power technology. But in the past it was used in mill, like with mills. And the, it, what hydropower essentially is, is that you're harnessing, harnessing the motion of water for electricity, right? That's just the basic, it's very similar to steam. You're harnessing water, although at the time that was steam and pressure, for electricity. And so when he visited the site on the 31st of July, that Norsk hydro site in, in Rilkan, it was very similar to how we do hydropower now. It was a dam, actually. He visited a reservoir, and the entrepreneur who was one of the founders of Norsk Hydro, who produced the fertilizer, said they act, this is one of the most powerful, most beautiful uh, waterfalls in Norway. And they were able to turn it on and off. They turned it on for him, but actually most of the time they had to turn it off. And the water you would see is in a reservoir in a dam. So when you release the water, you're creating this motion through, and then when it comes down, potential energy, it gains potential energy. So when it moves down, you gain kinetic, and this is how you create hydropower, right? And so how much electricity you can create is dependent on the volume of the water, and it's dependent on the drop, the elevation. Because Norway is so powerful in terms of waterfall, you can, you can imagine how much electricity they're able to create, but by creating this dam technology and with the piping in the back of the mountain, it was even more, much more electricity. Just because run of river technology, you can harness it and you create electricity, and there is electricity from a natural drop, but even more when the human, when man, when they can control it. So this was very, this is essentially what hydropower was. And so when you look at his letters, he uses it, if you notice, he uses it in situations that he did not even, <laughs> and I always wondered, what did he mean by that? What did he mean by that? What did he mean by hydropower? Like for example, when he talks about on July 15th, when he's in the region of the, he's in, I think on July 15th, he's in Lofoten region in the north, he talks about how fjords exist. What are fjords, which I, it took me a long time to figure out when I was on that trip, but he wrote that uh, all the changes to those solid mountain blocks that surround him are caused by hydropower. As this country is located in the northern part of the world, it's a, it's a cold climate, and in the winter the snow falls on the top of the mountain and gets heavier and heavier, and when the snow becomes solidly packed, it turns into a force that's able to explode rock through pressure from the hydropower. And he says at the end, he said perhaps, or conversely, the weather is warm enough to melt it, and the melting snow will forcefully tumble down, sweeping through the exploded rocks, breaking them into small particles. And these finely broken rocks will flow along the water currents, causing erosion, which will create a deep water channel that reaches the sea. And I was reading this, I'm like, what does he mean by hydropower? And he says this in several letters. You know, this is caused by hydropower. And when he describes waterfalls, he says the same thing. He says that, you know, when it's cold, there will be fog, smoke, rain, which will be frozen to form a pack of ice. Therefore, the water that tumbles down around the fjord will never end and the water will never dry out. It's evident that hydropower is forceful and it can change not only the land, but the mountains. So what does he mean by hydropower in this sense? This is something, this is one, when you read through the letters, and if you go through the letters, if you're able to go through the book, he talks a, lo a lot about it. And on the 22nd, he and if you notice on the 15th, he talks about it also. But on the 22nd, when he's in the fjord region, he actually talks about how when, he was traveling, a lot of the cities were at, a lot of the people weren't able to live in certain areas because rocks would constantly fall down and collapse. 
And he says that it was very scary, in fact, and he said that a lot of people, they weren't storing their boats inside, you know, uh, a certain storehouse. They would be damaged by the rocks. And he said even the trees are damaged, you know, bent or uprooted by the wind. If the trees grow where snow or ice is slide by, they will be dashed into pieces and scattered around. Those left will be torn or bent. And he compares it to a small bonsai plant in a small pot with a branch hanging down to the pot's mouth is an imitation of a large tree being destroyed by the snow. What is the point of talking about trees? Even mountains are ruined and cannot resist the power of snow and ice, which makes it very difficult to live. What does he mean when he says hydropower in this sense? Because this is before he even went to Ryokan to see the hydropower taking place in, this is the end of his trip in fact, when he went to see the fertilizer factory. What did he mean? I think he knew what it meant ultimately, but I think symbolically, you know, it's, it's kind of like what we talked about, this power of nature and the power that even you as a human being, you can't change nature and nobody can, no, even rocks and landscape, even landscapes can't survive water. So he uses water as this comparison, it's more of a metaphor that, you know, water is so powerful, it's formless, it's fluid, and it takes on many different formats. So you, you have ice, you have water, you have whatever. And even though it's something that can look formless, it looks like it moves and it's fluid, how is it can eat, cut through the mountains? It has the power to cut through mountains. And even in nature, we have this hierarchy that water has so much force and so much power that it can cut through this landscape and bend it at its will. It can create flower petal-like uh, mountain caps that are so beautiful and it can create fjords. You know, this is something that he was really amazed by. And when he talks about it, you know, you can say that he didn't understand hydropower, but I don't think so. I think it's his way of trying to understand the nature. He, you have to understand time, we don't have anything like this. So I think that this was his way of not only trying to understand the nature around him, but also kind of finding himself in this grand nature that he felt was much bigger than him, that w you can do what you can and you try to accomplish what you do. You have these ambitions, but at the end of the day, nature is something much more powerful than you. And this water, although it's something that you can drink, it's something that you can touch and it's formless in that form, it has the power to cut even through stone and rock. So it's something that you have to respect. It's higher than you. This is how I interpreted it when I looked at it, and it's something that really affected me when I was reading his writing. And it was a question that, I, you know, when you read his letters, I want you to really notice how often he uses the term hydropower and how does he use it. And on the other side, coin, side of the coin, at the end, we talk about this idea that when we go back and read the final letter he talks about, right? He talks about human resilience and human innovation. He said, you know, the things that humans are capable of, he said he could have never imagined. He said that he thought about the idea of electricity, he saw it in its experimental forms, but he never thought that if we reach a day, we would be able to see what he sees. And he thinks that sometimes in this fight for survival, you are pushed to innovate and create, and this is just, you know, it's a way of how the mind works, it's how you survive. And so before we talk about the old woman in Torhat, and we don't know her name, so unfortunately we called her old woman, uh, <laughs> is that we go back to a little bit of nature. He talks about how water cuts through mountains. He talks about how stones and ice falls unpredictably. He said very many times that he could not believe how positive Norwegians were because he says that even in order to even build a, uh, these train tracks, to, they had to cut through mountain, they had to build barriers to protect it from the falling ice and rocks. They had to build plows, they put plows in the front of trains back then. 
they had to work around nature because this was very important. So when he described Norwegian people, he was really impressed. He said they never complained. They, you know, they live in a climate where there's only pretty much three months out of the year where you can grow. You can have agriculture and you can have uh, crops. It's green, it has grass. And otherwise, in other times of the year, they say even people struggle to grow anything. And this resulted in a lot of mass immigration, a lot of immigration in the late 19th, early 20th century. Because how can you survive? You can't live, you can't grow anything. It's very beautiful, but you can't grow. And what was going on also is they ended up, there was, he was saying in his letters that he had to give, like a lot of Norwegian had to feed their goats and cows ground fish because they didn't have enough grass, you know, at the time. And so he said, you know, the issue came is that a lot of people lived off fish, fishing. But when they started to allow whaling, they legalized it, which initially a lot of the fish swam into the fjords as a safe haven from the currents and from whales. So when they legalized it, this changed a bit, right? And how people can make a livelihood. And he said that people never complained. And this is when he describes, let me try to find it here. He says, when you consider the advantages and disadvantages of this country, we must be puzzled by the perseverance and willingness of the inhabitants. They are not hampered by difficulties which are disadvantages of this landscape. They only consider the advantages that will be their benefit. They never give up, step aside, or become disheartened. Not only that, they try to search for the benefits from the landscape in order to create far, uh, yield far-reaching outcomes. You know, and when you think about what he talks about in his final letters, he, this is something that, that he, he contemplates a lot, is that you know, people are capable of great resilience and of survival and it's human condition to push and to create in order to actually exist in the climate that, that they're given. Despite the harsh landscape, when they found the iron in the mountains near Lofoten Islands in Narwick, what did they do? They built the train tracks to be able to transport it. When it was difficulty with the falling rocks and ice, they built the covers for it in the, and the plow. He asked people if it was difficult. No one complained. They said it was part of how they lived in that climate. They were created from it. And something that was very interesting was the use of hydropower. When he discovered that they used hydropower to create electricity, that was very interesting because at the time, when you have steam power in Norway, steam was very expensive. So he said, the king said in his letter on July 9th, that in fact hydropower was 85% cheaper than steam because waterfall is naturally occurring and the wa landscape is full of water. It's renewable energy. And they were able to look beyond and able to take advantage of the positives and the benefits in the climate. And so the final, when I talk about the king, this will be a final story. I talked about with Gwen about this. We go back to the first letter. This is a story that actually we already read, but I didn't finish it. This is one of the first locations that he went to on his, his way north. They stopped on the island and they took a walk with the old woman and, his, and, his son, and her son. He walked up, he felt tired, and he rested. He looks around, and as he waits for the old woman and son, he's exhausted. He looks out over the sea, and he sees all these large and intimidating mountains, and he's probably thinking, like, oh, what am I doing? I'm so tired. And when the woman, come back, he actually, woman comes back, she actually says to him, she, he actually asks her, how do you live? Is, is this difficult? Are you happy? He asked him, he didn't mean it in a condescending way. It sounds better in the text. I think it's the way I said it was not so good. But, you know, she, and she said that she, see, she was happy with her life. She said that this island was unsurpassed by other places because it was more abundant than gra uh, with grass than elsewhere. She can raise six cows, 
All dairy products, milk and butter, come from these six cows and sufficient to feed her entire family. She was able to, the only money she needed was to buy flour to make bread. And she was able to do this because the fish she sold fetched enough money to buy the grass to feed. You know, she, she never complained once. And this, when I read this story and I, asked, I talked to the literature professor, I asked her, why did he remember her? The first story, he talked about this woman quite in depth. And he said, you know, he's, as a writer, the king is very actually detailed, as you can tell from his letter, very, very detailed, contemplative, and very, very interested in the human condition. And of course, in people in his position, I know I'm not that important, but even for me, I meet a lot of people. And so what I remember are things that aren't necessarily what they look like or who they are, where they come from. I remember their words and their actions. I remember the things that define them. These are things that I, I remember. I don't know what he, how he feels because we're different, but he both, but I think he's similar. I think that as a person, he's interested in why people do, do things and how can they survive in this climate because in a sense, how, did, how can I survive? You know, like, I think he was kind of saying that in a way, how can I survive? Like when he was, trying to maintain sovereignty and keep his territories, he said it in his letter, I don't want to live. I don't, want to, I don't know if I can survive this. Can I survive this? You know, like, you know, and so I think that when he asked her, it was very sincere. For me, it, you know, the way I read it was quite bad. But, it, you know, in the letter, it was very sincere, especially if you know his writing style and if you know his past and his history, which is why I talked about it very much in depth, because it's important to understand what drives people. I think in a way this trip was a bit of a self-searching, like, you know, <laughs> because in 19, by the time 1907 came, the treaty was signed. He gave Angkor Wat and, si and Siem Reap back to, and he gave them to the French. In return, he got Trat and Jantaburi. So he was able to maintain sovereignty by that time. So by that time, he was able to, li he was lifted of that burden. So by the time he went to Norway, it was almost this kind of search. I felt, this is what I felt when I read this letter. And when I read the final letter, this is exactly, I felt exactly this is what he was going for. So this is the, the, old, the old, I'm like calling her an old woman, but she's an old woman. Um, so you don't see very well because the photo is quite dark, but this is his family sitting. This is the island. Torhatan, and it actually means like the it, the hat because it, it looks like the shape of a hat these women would wear to the market. So they called it Torhatan, the hat that you'd wear to the market. And so, how did this connect to me? So, a lot of people asked when they read my letters. You know, they're personal letters actually throughout the exhibition when we talked. The reason we went through all these quotes and I read you all those questions I had is because I, had, I was trying to really understand why he drove him and why he felt the way he did because this allowed me to connect with him, you know? And I didn't want to create copies of his letters. I wanted to, in a way, dialogue with him. And so I didn't take any, a lot of the photos didn't take place where he took photos. They tried. They weren't successful. They took me to the same places, and I said, we're different people. We're separated by over 100 years. What we see, what he sees, and what I see are not the same. But we will connect in some, we'll connect somewhere. We'll meet somewhere in the middle. We'll meet somewhere. And so when I went into Norway, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I knew the history. I knew the idea of her, you know, that he was driven by something, the sense of trying to find what drives him and why people do things, but I didn't know. I knew that nature was all powerful and, and you know, full of duality, I knew that, but there was something missing and then I realized it was the idea of people's relationship with nature and resilience and this is something he talked in depth in and I realized in the beginning of the trip actually with Hans who didn't know he would be the star of the third floor of my exhibition. After the trip to, Nor to North Cape, 
I remember I, I climbed up that mountain. It was covered in, in haze. We could not even see. The king says that he looks out and he sees the sea. It's the clearest day that he has on his trip. I looked down and I saw nothing. It was white, pure white. When we tried to go to the end of the cliff, we were pushed back by the wind. It was so strong. And I remember that day we couldn't even leave the mountain for two, two hours because we were told that a woman off of a, a cruise boat was lost. She was an old woman. And they left without her. Her family left without her. They discovered that grandma was not on the boat anymore. And then they couldn't find her. For two hours, they were walking around. And they were so scared that she would faint. It was cold. It was raining. They were afraid that she would like, fall off the cliff. Two hours later, they found her in a fetal position on the ground, hidden by white. I remember thinking, like, you know, I asked Hans at the time. I said, you know, and this is before I even, you know, thought about Torghatten and the king's experiences there. I said, you know, is it hard for you to live here? You grew up here. Is the extreme weather and the climate and the unpredictability, is it something that's difficult for you? And he, I actually asked him this. I was curious. And he said, no, you know, like, this is just the way it is. You know, the, it's so beautiful, and all the good comes with all of not the bad but the harshness everything goes hand in hand and he doesn't see it as something negative he said to me this was in the exhibition he says mine can i take you to this small island after the winter in the spring a lot of the kids will go to this island because it's covered in cloud berries after the winter we go and he says we're a little bit late in the season but let's see if we find one and he actually walks around. He walks around for about 15 to 20 minutes, and he discovers there's only actually one cloudberry left, and which is right here. And I remember at the time, our communications partner and I were staring each other down because we both really wanted that last cloudberry. I, I mean, I won, obviously. And then it was very sour. And you know, and it's something, it was such a small moment but it made a really, really big impression on me at the time. It was almost like I had a puzzle and I didn't know how to complete the last bit until I met Hans. And this was an experience that had nothing to do with his trip. He had never gone to this location at all. He had never experienced it. He had didn't experience the taste of a cloud berry. Maybe he did, I don't think he did. And I didn't think it was necessary to experience the same things. I think we can connect in different ways through feelings and emotions and experiences that we have. And this made an impression because I was so amazed at, you know, you never complained. He, he didn't complain at all. And this is something I really found was a common factor when I talked to a lot of Norwegians is that, you know, when you live in a climate that's so, sev not severe, but harsh like this, the only way that you can survive, it, it, your instinct is to kind of fight, right? And then you fight for ways to actually take advantage of the benefits and you create hydropower, which is naturally occurring. And I figure this is why he talks about water so much because it's so much water that it's, a benefit to them, but it's also a liability. It was also something that caused a lot of damage, you know, with the rocks that tumbled down, with difficulty in, in living their lifestyle. Water was very powerful in both good and bad ways. But they were able to harness it for the benefit. And this was something that I was really impressed with. I, I still, to this day, I say when I talk about Norwegians, I'm like, you know, they're very honest. It felt very honest, sincere, and it felt there was no intrigue. And when the king talks about his, Rama V talks about the king of Norway, the, first, the king of Norway, he said the same thing. He's without, he's direct in his speech and action without intrigue. I felt like this sense of uh, intimacy that, in this fence, uh, you know, that he didn't feel in a long time. So this was something that, you know, basically what took place, you know, it was very long, sorry, but the history was something that I felt was very important because when you turn to the final letter and you read, when you read all the letters and you read the final letter, it makes a lot more sense. 
And you talk a lot of things he talks about. It wasn't sad. It wasn't anything. He actually was quite. He, I think he was going to search for why did people do the things to do? Why did I experience this negatively, the negative things? But he re I think he understood more about the human condition and why he does things. And this was actually the basis of human a aspiration. You know, this is just basically what I thought. And when I was putting the, the exhibition together, I'll, I'll go through the exhibition. This is what it looks like. Um, I showed a lot in the previous slide, so I'm just showing a little bit. This is the entrance. We were very light with how we installed everything because I believe that when you work in situ, which is when you work in a historic space, it's about balance. You don't want the contemporary story, the story that I have connecting with my grandfather, great-great-grandfather, to clash with the story of the site, which is very powerful, actually. It's very, very powerful site. When I first went into the site, I took photos, and I remember I took it with a Fuji film, actually, the 400. And I remember I was like, the, you know, maybe it's a bit nerdy and a bit as a photographer, you think that they said, I feel like when the building speaks. It speaks in, in cool tones, in greens, blues, grays. And this is something that I want to integrate into the design. So in order to have this delicate balance, you need to know what's too much, what's too little. And you need to have respect for the place you're in. I got a lot of complaints during this exhibition that I put in only 19 photos. Why the heck, what the heck, WTF? And I said, you know, when you're creating an experience, what I wanted to do that was like his writing, too much is a liability. Too much creates confusion. And so when you reduce the amount and you're able to build around in dimensions, which is through design, which I did through the color tones and through how we hanged, how we installed, this actually is able to connect with the history of the site. And it's the right balance that when you walk in, it's this experiential and this feeling, this veil feeling, that this veiled feeling that you see in the king's writing. I really wanted to emulate his writing style, but visually and through his feelings, through feelings also. I made a really big mistake by doing a, a white background on this one. Sorry, guys. But this is the second floor, so I didn't talk about this in this exhibition, but if you want to know more information, we can go to the, you can read in the book. But this is more of my uh, analysis, kind of more me on this floor. So when you walk in, this floor was quite dangerous. There were some holes in the front. And so we covered it with this kind of cloth wall, which when the lighting moved through, it kind of created the same feeling he had when he said he was on Torkotten and the light was brighter than normal, like a painting, like a Norwegian painting. It created the exact same feeling. And when you look down at the photos, which are the letters in the photos are down, they, it was meant to sim create an experience like you're traveling. You go up to the, th this is the photos. So this talked more about his experience in the, in the fjord region. So we don't have much time, so I won't talk about get into that. This is the third floor, and it's the view from the room of the king, where the king's letter were, looking into the room where Han's story was. Everything we didn't touch, we didn't install, didn't put anything on the, we weren't allowed to touch the structure. The pink came with the structure, guys. It wasn't me. And so, we wanted to keep as much of the story of the structure as possible. At first, the lighting designer, because the problem when you're creating light is that there's so much light coming in through the windows that it's a detriment to lighting design. She shot everything, it was dark. But the problem is when you shot everything, it's almost like you're putting a cloth over the story of the structure. We told them to open everything. They said, but this will affect how people view the, paint, the photos. And I said, it's part of the experience. I don't want them to lose sight of what the building is. And so they actually got, we had multiple people coming back a couple times throughout the day to actually see the change in lighting from morning to night because the feelings were different. This is the view looking into the king's room. And we have 
finally, we have my letters and then you close with his. So we have three letters that I wrote that were kind of reflection of his. Then I have a final letter that's like a reflection, kind of like his letter. And what you see is a projection of all the photos that were taken on his trip. It's meant to be more reflective and a lot of people told me, because we only gave people about 30 minutes total to see the entire list, I don't remember. But a lot of people said they wish they had more time because it's the kind of exhibition that requires time. And so at the end, I, re I even remember the cultural attache of the French consulate. She walked past me when she was walking out of the exhibition and she goes, it sticks with me. And this is what we are trying to do, what I was trying to do when I was creating this, this design. I wanted the curatorial content not only to be in the text, but I wanted to be something that was reflected in all of the design. And so this is how basically the end. <laughs> and so if you have any questions at all, you can ask. And if you want to see more photos, then you can kind of look at the book that's in the back. We have the book that's over on the back of the table. Thank you so much, Kamai. Uh, I think you actually transported us there. We were with you, um, especially some of those stunning uh, photographs and, uh, and in fact, paintings. Uh, at, at one point, it looked like it was very confusing what was a painting and what was a photograph. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, really. Um, so yeah, beautifully done, and uh, you ran us through all the geopolitics of the era as well as through the trip, and, and we also feel we were at the exhibition. Um, so I think we, we've just got, we, we, can, we will serve drink if people want drinks and, and food, but we're going to take a few questions. I can see um, our vice president is up there, eager to ask something. Um, you you yes. promoted me, Gwen, I'm not a vice president anymore. And uh, when you ask a question, go up to the <laughs> microphone and, and introduce yourself. Um, could I have a quick, um, actually just a couple of quick questions. Um, one is, you talked a lot about letters. You know, the letters that your great-great-grandfather wrote and the letters that you wrote in response. I mean, letters seem such an old-fashioned form of communication, and it's been very important in your reflection and trying to get inside his mind. But that must be quite difficult to do now in the 21st century when nobody writes letters. Everyone writes emails or they just zap things on apps. And, and your thoughts about what the role of letters, you know, how, how you can use letters now to try to connect to the way that he was thinking. The, o the other question is, is about landscape. The Norwegian landscape that you've been to see and that he saw is bleak and treeless and cold. You know, what was it that appealed about that landscape to him? <laughs> I'll start with the landscape question. <laughs> you told me when we were talking, you're like, the weather looked really bad. <laughs> and I said, you know, actually, I... It was bad, but I did adjust it. It appealed to him because I think uh, he was looking like in his final letter, he was looking to, to discover this sense of human aspiration, right? Like why did people, why do people seek to survive? Well, like, you know, when people are trying to survive and try to resist being extinct, they push themselves to push themselves beyond in order to innovate and create ways in which so they can survive and it creates resilience. So I think that when he went to Norway, he saw how much power the land, the, you saw this kind of landscape is something you wouldn't see in Thailand. And it's something that I think when he went into it, part of it was that I think it humbled him. It made him in this search for aspiration, I guess. I use that word a lot. The Thai word is actually much better. But when you go in, I think all of the climbing, going in locations like that, it makes him feel that this is something that's bigger than him. And in this, it made him question himself a little bit. It made him realize how powerful the things here around him are. And that when he meets people, you know, it gave him this kind of almost encouragement, I guess. Because like when he was, during the socio-political issues and the wars, in the Siam Franco wars, he was quite discouraged and he was, you know, why do people do this? Why did he do, why did they do this? Mm. 
You know what I mean? And so by the end letter, you start to see that it's not sad, it's not angry, it's actually very accepting. And I think when he traveled through and you start to question, you see how people survive, you realize that when you live in this, in this location like this and you are fighting for survival, most people are going to fight to push forward. This is the natural human condition. And so I think he was humbled by that thought. And when he went in, he w it made him realize that this is just the way people can survive. I think that was mm. part of it. Mm. And then you, with letters, it's quite difficult because I think now with digital, although it creates a lot more access and it allows us to live stream this talk and it allows us to do a lot of things, I think the intimacy is lost slightly, you know, in letter format. This is the reason I was so important to me is because this was something that was a big, um, this, a lot of Thai culture, how they express themselves to each other, how they talk to each other in person. Us Thais, it's harder to talk about our emotions and our feelings. I think through letters, it was a bit easier. Also, lastly, when we talked about, like, you know, I used letters because I felt like, and I read a book recently that talked about this, when you have a book, it almost distills the memory and the emotion. But does it have, what can I do with modern technology? I, it can give the access, but it can't replace that emotion mm. or feeling. Mm. So I'm not sure if you can. Because mm. I've tried putting exhibitions on an online context, and can you recreate that feeling of experience when you read and you, you actually touch the paper and you read through it? You can, but you can have access. You can read it, but it's not 100% of what he felt in that moment. Thank you. That's yeah. uh, an excellent uh, answer. Uh, Please introduce yourself and... Hi, I'm, I'm Ed Knuth from Thomasite University. Kun Mai, I just wanted to thank you for your talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I'm, I'm a hobbyist photographer myself, and I was curious if your great-great-grandfather, was he a photographer himself, or did he have a, his own interest in photography? And also, I'm, I was just curious about the equipment and the cameras back then and, and how difficult it was for them to actually bring a camera on the, the trip. So basically, I, I mean, I don't know if His Majesty would say that he was a photographer, but I, I think he was. I think anybody who loves photography enough to do, I heard stories about how he would bring, he would arrange parties just so he could take photos of people with his new, ca with his cameras. Like he would raise, he would take hold the parties just so he could have people to take photos of. So I think he was a photographer, and so, Photography in Asia, in all around the world, we have the wet plate. We have the wet plate that which becomes the dry plate, which becomes the film, right? So during the 19th century, you see a lot of the photos, especially, I think, the fine arts department held many, two glass plate negative exhibitions. And these are photos which were taken. So glass plates began, uh, you see it in Rama III in a little bit, but Rama IV, they said, is the first king that allowed his portrait to be taken. Part of that is because Thai people are afraid when you take photos, it can take your soul. There's something that they believe. And so he took it so people can see that it's something that you can do mm. and it's not something that can take your soul. But over the evolution, technology changed. So from Rama IV, you'll notice that there's more blur. They didn't have shutter speed. What controlled shutter speed was the cap, right? So you take, open the cap, you have to stay in place, because I've done it for projects. You have to stay in place for up, depending on the lighting, 8 to 13 seconds. Imagine doing that. I couldn't. And then what happens is you put the cap back on, and that's what controlled the shutter speed. Mm. By the time Rama V came around, they, had more sh they, had sh they were able to control that shutter speed in glass plates. So I think, I'm not sure exactly what photo cameras he was using when he was on this trip, but I know by this time it had progressed to more advanced photography and he was actually able to take cameras with him that were not glass plates because in the past, the glass plates, as you've seen, they're very big. It's like a wooden box and depending on how large you want the photo to be, it will determine, like, because you construct it and it gets bigger and bigger depending on and you see in the photos, he actually has to have people carry it around. And then you have people having to set things up, then you have to have people sit still. When you're doing travel photography or if you're doing street photography, this wouldn't have been possible. It wouldn't have been possible, and it was a very expensive hobby at the time. Mm. 
-hmm. And so at the time it was a bit limited. So I think for your question, I think that was, I answered that part, that I think he, the cameras he used at the time, I'm not quite sure, but I know that it was a bit more portable, it was more advanced than, the, it wasn't the glass plate technology, in which he was able mm -hmm. to actually carry something with him. All yeah. right. Thank you. Yes, please. <coughs> My name is Jan Lund. I'm uh, Danish. Uh, I'm a foreign correspondent for Jyllandsposten, but I'm also occasionally writing books. And I just wrote a book about the relations between uh, Denmark and Thailand to 400 years. And I did a lot of research, especially about the relationship between Jula Longhorn and this admiral you were talking about. His name is Andreas Richelieu. Yes. And uh, it's, it's a lot about uh, power and money and uh, influence and geopolitics and like that, uh, a lot of it. So I wonder, uh, actually he, his family also came from Norway and Resilieu, he actually organized these trips yes. in, in, in yes. 87 and, uh, and 1907. But does he ever talk about the emotional relationships between them? or the influence that Richelieu had on him, because this is what you never find in, in, in other uh, research uh, matters where I have been. So he doesn't actually talk about it so much. So sometimes when we're looking at the writing and what he wrote, sometimes we have to look a bit in between the lines, a bit when we wanna see how people feel about the relationships they have with each other. And in terms of him, you know, what's very interesting is I think that it must have been very close because he talks about him affectionately in the letter. And in fact, he was in the service for 27 years and he was raised to the level of vice admiral. It's like one of the highest, it's like the highest position. And he fought in the, a war in which his own country says that foreign citizens can't be involved because of the geopolitics but he didn't, he chose to fight because he was considered a quite a close, con uh, I wouldn't say friend, I don't know if I would use the word friend, but he was an advisor. And when he went to, no to Norway, it was actually at the behest of, of him. He was the one that invited him. He said, I hold some stock in this and I, I you know, our family runs the ferries and you know, things like that. And he was the reason why he decided initially to go to um, Norway. Mm. And it was him also who plans the trips with Bennett, which is a uh, travel agency that has existed since the, founded in like the mid 19th century. And perhaps when you wanna see how someone feels, it's hard, he doesn't say it openly, but I think you can tell by the way he talks about him, right? So for example, on the letter on July 12th, he says, when he says, I just don't know if I can climb up this mountain. I, he told Prayashoni, he told him, I can't do this. I can't do this. Mm. If you're able to express this kind of weakness, you know, anyone, you don't have to be a king, a human being, you know, um, someone who's very proud, you wouldn't be expressing it to someone who's not close to you, right? So maybe he did not state it so openly, but I think you can see it through the writing that the relationship was closer than he would have with other people in his, the position. And it was also him that when he said the king was worried that he couldn't, he spoke with the Norwegian sailors and the carpenter to help create almost like like a palaquin, like a way to carry the king up. He said, we can do it, we'll help you. It's like when his brother during the Baknam incident said, you know, we're here, we're ready to help you. We're ready to row, you just have to tell us. And he said basically this same thing, don't worry, we're here, you just have to tell us and we'll help you. Mm. I think Hi. this reflects a lot. Yeah, excellent point. Um, okay, we'll just take two more uh, and then so, People are. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm Major General Acha Bungapu. I'm a life member here from Human Link Center, which is harmony between people, harmony between people and nature. Anyway, I'm very impressed that you transport us back in time. And you have, look like you have a special conduit that you can interpret from the letters of your great great grandfather. And my friend over here, 
they are, they are your fan club. And they also have special connection with King Rama V through what drove him to make a canal, San Sap Canal, yeah. to Chak Chang Sao and to protect the country in the old days. And this is Thai family from Chak Chang Sao. I wonder what is your special talent? How, how do you dig deep <laughs> inside your soul and interpret all this and come out with in this interpretation? Because I would like to have even one, not half, one, one fourth of what you have so I can connect back to our roots and bring it alive to this present day. Thank you. <laughs> well, there you go. That's Your very, secrets. thank you. Um, I mean, I don't think I have a talent or anything. It's just when I looked at it, I have a natural tendency to rebel against everything everyone tells me. So when I looked at the letters, I didn't want to do what everyone else did. The, following the path of the king in Norway, everyone did that but it doesn't bring you any closer to connecting to why he existed and who he was. And I thought it was really important, you know, because I work in the heritage field, that when I create work, it's something that has long-term sustainability and it's something that actually creates some movement in people's minds. That was something that I really wanted. And in order to make someone who's a public figure, an official figure that people are not usually used to interacting with, make it him a bit more accessible, I thought it would make him alive, right? So I tried to humanize the situation. I looked into all the text and I tried to find commonalities where people didn't see it, that were a bit more human. And then I realized that he talks about, you know, beyond the socio-political situation. You know, I didn't want to talk about that completely, but I wanted to talk about all the glue that tied all these events together. So I found that he has such a huge interest in nature and it was something that actually, it made him feel better I think in his search for mm -hmm. trying to find peace and solace. And I think that it was something that he talked throughout his letters, but no one talked about. The fact that he talked about nature, he talked about how water, you know, the weakness of a human being and how actually we're driven six to survive and we do we can do so and so in Norway that what touched him particularly is also the landscape that was so unlike anywhere else but the fact that water is something that was had its advantages and disadvantages in the climate mm. you know and so right. I think that it really pushed people to survive and this was a common theme and I think it played a big part in how he was able to conclude his search for what he was looking for at his final letter. Mm. And so that's Thank what you. I was going for, yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, last but yeah. not least. <laughs> uh, I'm Lekha Shankar, I write for a newspaper in India. That was very fascinating and what I learned from it is many things. You try to humanize a larger than life, you know, a figure, a royalty. And uh, from what I understood, you brought out uh, the good and bad of human um, aspirations, right. of nature, of water, you know, both facets which uh, were the discovery. I just wonder from your own point of view, after 100 years, all right, you, you have many diverse interests, you do so many different things. Have you, what, and you've lived in the US, you're now back in Thailand. Um, what have you yourself learned for the highs and lows of, you know, the East-West Synodrome? human aspirations, I s and what drives yeah. you? You know, for me, this is a very personal question because I, I'm, I mean, I'm from, I'm Californian, but I lived in New York for over 10 years. And when I moved back to Thailand, I said I'd be back here for four months. It's been six years, FYI. And so when I came back, you know, a lot of it was really hard because not the language, not because of the language, which I could speak, not so well, but still speak, but it was because we think differently. And I think something that I realized when I came back was that, um, and the difficulty of it was realizing that, you know, I grew up in the United States and what I think is right isn't necessarily what they think is right and how we communicate isn't necessarily how they communicate. And when you move somewhere, you have to meet people where they are, 
Because it's not your, it, it is my country, but it's the country, it's my, you know, I didn't grow up there. So this is something that I really, really learned very closely when I came here. It was a huge struggle in the beginning, but then when you realize that you, you need to meet people where they are. People are different than you. People think and they function and even the concept of letters is different. So when you come, you have to, I had to really adapt. And the way I did so was by understanding that, you know, I had to meet them where, I had to meet them, I mean myself, because I am Thai. And I ended up being able to slowly, it's still a struggle from time to time. And, you know, it's, I mean, obviously I stayed for over six years because there was something that was good, you know, that, you know, I saw so many opportunities to create and to change how we learn and, and understand and absorb history and, and education, you know? So it made me stay, but in the beginning that was something, probably the biggest lesson I learned when I came back was that mm. I can't expect. It's like what he was saying about, you know, at the end of the day, the, the landscape seemed to shape around the water, you know? they had to move around the water because this was paramount. Mm. So this is kind of how I thought, saw things. <laughs> well, you ended up a long way from cutting edge New York art scenes or fashion designers, uh, but you seem, uh, seem, so what's your next project, I would ask? So I actually worked on a Khon project for two, three years afterwards. Most of That's my work- That's Thai classic dancing. Yeah, yeah, so most of my work is very similar which is I try to see how we can create interaction with historic topics and how can we interact and is adaptation possible and how much is too much, how little is too little. So this is something I'm very interested in. And so most of the projects are in the form of uh, curatorial work. So I've curated uh, four exhibitions and a lot of them cater to the idea that you know, for Wang Na, what it actually was is that there wasn't, it was a front palace that people didn't know was existed. So it's about introducing the information incrementally, how much, how, to, how little. And at the end, we brought the exhibition back to the palace in which we were able to, thank to the Kom we were able to do the exhibition in the throne hall, which was the throne hall of the second king, uh, Paping Kao. So what we ended up doing was inviting artists artists, uh, you know, various artists. We had singers, we had visual artists, we had textile mm. designers, and we gave them information. And we said, we want you to spend three to four months in this site. And I want you to create a story based off the feelings and the attachment and the relationship you have with it. And I wanted to see how can we, with a historic topic, properly and responsibly and respectfully move forward. So I most of my projects take this kind of tilt so uh, it's Cohen was very similar. Nice. The artists worked, and we t we set up meetings, and we talked to people who are Cohen performers, who are academics, and he himself was a contemporary arts co uh, choreographer for three months. Just any questions he had, mm. anything he had in his mind, and he created work based off these conversations. Right, so next. Yeah, next one is, unsure. well, I was, it's a secret, I can't oh. tell. Can you give us a hint? Can you give us a I hint? I mean, the reason I talked to all about the other ones is that it's gonna You're be along the, the same You're in the journalist club. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of being a little bit nostalgic for what I did at the Front Palace. So for the next pa for the next project, I'd actually like to work with a site again. I have one in mind. And I wanna work with a site and see if we can kind of create an interpretation of the space, not as it was, but create that same feeling when people walk into the customs house and they feel like they're enveloped by this history and momentarily they feel a bit transported. So I want to create something like that. I have a site in mind, so it's going to be more in situ. So it's going to be something similar to what I did at Wang Na, a bit of mix of Wang Na and a bit of mix of this one. All right. We're talking about the National Museum, right? No. Uh, well, yeah, that Wang Na National Museum. Right. This project isn't, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, we'll be watching for that. And Thank um, you. on that note, I'd, um, I'd really, I'd like to hand over to our president, Panu, um, but say a personal thanks. But I think Panu is going to, thank you, so don't, don't go yes. Uh, oh. In just okay. a minute.
Oh, good mic up. Uh, we would like, on behalf of the Foreign Correspondent Club of Thailand, we would like to thank you very much for uh, coming here today and speak and, and give us this wonderful presentation. And on behalf of the club, um, I would like to also um, give you this uh, book by Ben Davies, who's uh, one of our valued members, uh, as a token of uh, our appreciation. Thank you very much. Joe.